I'm going to open the lyrics. Nice. That'll be handy to have. <laughs> uh, hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 14. Of what? Alex. Yeah. Alex I know. Analyze Billy Joel lyrics. Hi, Jim. Hey. And I realize my thing now apparently is, is that when I tell you the title, I yell the first part real loud. Hey. I just go, hey. <laughs> And then you calibrate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you've been, uh, uh, oh, the the uh, epi the song I'm going to pick for next week was suggested by a different person. Again. Uh -huh. So there's at least, there's another person listening. Okay, so it is uh, a viewer. Yeah. Okay, not just like somebody who walked by on the street. <laughs> hey, what <well>, Billy Joel... <laughs> Ah, I'll tell you if you stop bothering me, mister. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just kind of exciting. Um, and uh, what did he say? He said something like, boy, you're, if you're going to be doing, and I can't remember which song he, he was like, which is not even a B, and it's just not even a B plus song. You should at least do this song. I'm like, all right, all right, Malfi, I'll do it. Oh, wow. <laughs> he meant oh, wow. That he, he meant it humorously, but but still. But still, come on. Still. Make it the nice. Hey, so uh, real quick, I'll just share this uh, outside of Billy Joel observation. Uh, when Barack Obama was my president, I would get <laughs> a lot of spam emails for, uh, hey, do you want Obamacare? And it, yeah. and it wouldn't be from actual the healthcare system it would be some other nonsense they were you know it would be a scam but they'd call it obamacare and then for the last couple years i've been getting spam do you want trump care <laughs> which of course trump care is uh not nothing. A thing. it's nothing yeah it's not a like you can't even say trump care and follow by the name of one of his kids <laughs> Trump, I mean, Trump don't care. Yeah, you, you can't. His whole brand is not caring. Yeah. So not even a, a week into the administration, I started getting emails for Biden care. Oh no. The scammers are not good at it sometimes. I've I I mean this is a uh so this is a true story. I got an email you sometimes you'll get an email and the email is tries to trick you into opening it and they have some kind of a program that'll like knows keywords you use so they'll yeah. try to trick you so it'll be like your friend alex has something important to share with you and right. then it's like boner pills or whatever yeah. that and, was actually me but okay and thank you they're working amazing <laughs> great good yeah I have, I have like two a day they're not, they don't affect your boner. They just look like little boners. Yeah, exactly. There's vitamins. vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Flintstones, but it's just. Yeah. yeah. But they're dongs. <laughs> <laughs> the Flintstones dongs. Yeah, what's those dongs? Oh, that's good. Ah, I need a big one today. <laughs> Come here, Fred. <laughs> so one time I got, so it'll go words you use a lot and many years ago it still makes me laugh that i got a uh email that was alleged to be from gary hitler <laughs> wow and the funny part to me is i don't know anyone named gary <laughs> <laughs> well you have to ask yourself how how often am I bringing up Hitler that it's going through my thing? And it's like, ah, this oh, is kind of a lot. Yeah. Kind of a hey, lot. Do you want boner pills? And do you, does it matter to you if the trains run on time? <laughs> well, if I got news for you. <laughs> oh. All right. So this week, Alex picked a song that um, was lovely to listen to a little more often this week. Because uh, I don't think I, I listen to it very often because it's an old song. It's off of Turnstiles, came out in the 70s, and that, that would be uh, Summer Highland Falls. Yeah. 
I picked it because it, I've seen him in concert uh, somewhere between eight and 12 times. And I think he's played it every time. Yeah. He, Billy Joel, loves this song. And so I thought, since we're a Billy Joel podcast, we would do him a solid. Mm-hmm. And we'll do one he likes. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really put much thought into like, oh, or, yeah, like I didn't really remember the lyrics when I was uh, suggesting it. Uh, and so I have played it a few times this week. And the piano is, again, very beautiful. Yeah. Maybe little piano riffs. Um, and the lyrics are kind of weird. Yeah. yeah, again, not, it doesn't sound lyrically like himself in a way. Yeah. And I think it is like younger songwriter, maybe overreaching in a few places, uh, trying to do too much with a song, maybe. I don't know. But it's, there are a lot of big words. Yeah. Here's my my takeaway, because it doesn't sound very much like a lot of Billy Joel songs, exactly like you're saying. And I think it's possible that this song is the closest to a truly autobiographical, this is how I'm feeling, this is how I'm hurting as we get into the lyrics. Right. I think it's, it would make sense to me that he would do it often if it's, if it represented a raw point in his life and and also, if you, if you wrote down some thoughts about a raw point in your life, and then later on, you were able to move past it and look back on it fondly, well, then, yeah, let's play the tune. Yeah, that probably would be one of your favorites. Yeah. And isn't it also just musically uh, all, uh, sparse in a way? Sparse, yeah. It's a pretty simple song. Um, I think it's like he wants you to focus on those weird lyrics. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it does feel like work, like he's doing some psychiatry on himself. Yeah. Um, maybe afterwards, maybe at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to tell, but it, it always struck me as a weird one to always play. Yeah. I was like, of course you always are, you know, you, you have to play pressure every time. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. But then every time, like, Summer Highland Falls, everybody. And people love it, of course, because it is beautiful piano. Yeah. And that's maybe, uh, that's a good point. You got to play pressure. You got to play my life. And, but maybe this is the one he's like, okay, I got to play those. You guys got to hear this. Because this is. Yeah. Yeah. This is my life. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. It's gorgeous. I think he's in a weird position. Uh, I guess a lot of older rock stars are because they have songs they have to play. And he's got like probably 25 or 30 of those. Yeah. Where everyone's going to be mad if you didn't do Still Rock and Roll to Me or Pressure or Allentown or Piano Man or, you know, and so on. Um, there's not much room on the set list for stuff that like you remembered that you did and you're like, oh, right. Oh, I like that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you, it, yeah, it's always in there. Well, it's interesting too, then if you're a Billy Joel fan, like, like us and like anybody right now, you don't currently have to worry and haven't had to worry about it for a while. Ah, oh, this will all be the new album. You don't have to worry about that. No. Yeah, no, it's great. You're like, I'm going to fucking know these songs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I saw him in Chicago and he pretty much said the same thing. Um, <laughs> before he started playing the first song, he was like, hey, uh, I don't know what everybody's doing here. I don't have anything new. <laughs> All right, anyway. All right, so, so you've been to Billy Joel concerts a lot. So I have. Let me ask, I'm going to ask you a hypothetical going to a Billy Joel concert question, and, mm-hmm. then, and then we'll start the lyrics. But here's the question. You're at a Billy Joel concert. You have decided you just have a wicked craving for a hot pretzel okay uh-huh and because it's that kind of concert there's older people there so it's less pot more hot pretzel smell um what song do you hear and you go okay i like this song but this is a perfect song for me to go get a hot pretzel 
Boy, that's a fine question. God, there, <laughs> there aren't many. Um, you know what it is for me? Uh, it's in the middle of the night. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I, that, okay, cool. You're like, all right. That's the closest thing you have to something from the new album. Yeah. <laughs> oh my, okay. I don't need to hear this like your half-assed Graceland impression. Ah, that's funny. I can look. I, whenever we do get to that song, if we do, um, I then I I know already part of the thing is I like that song a little better than you do. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't know why it bugs me. Uh, it's perfectly fine. It's, yeah. But, but yeah, that's a grown on me song. That's a song that in the very beginning. Um, there's still parts of it that I think are ridiculous because <laughs> the part in the big, be- even just the part in the beginning, ooh, ah, I'm like, nope. Yeah, no. No. no you're trying- that. That's the thing where you're, he's trying too hard to sound like a guy, a church singer, or a, trying to sound like a black guy. That's too much. <laughs> yeah. A little that gospel, a, a little uh, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Yeah, that's a um, that's a bridge. Yeah, too far. Uh, it's a mess. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and yet, I've some of the lyrics we've actually mentioned before. I really like because I find them funny. Yes. But I don't know if he meant them to be funny. They just seem <laughs> funny to me. We have it's an eternal problem with him. It's like, are you? <laughs> did you mean to be ridiculous just now? Because if you were, great. great. And if you weren't, then just great for me, I guess. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I'm a little, a little bit sad for you. Yeah, and I'm sorry, but you're silly. Hey, uh, yes, you're a very silly man. Um, we, I've noticed, we keep talking about like songs that sound like a Billy Joel song versus don't sound like a Billy Joel song. So I pose this question to you. Okay. What do you think is the song that sounds the most like Billy Joel? The archetypal, that's a fucking Billy Joel song if there ever was one. I'm inclined to say that you go way back and to me it's uh, just the way you are. Exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one where you're like, yeah, that's in, that's you, exactly. Yep. It ain't even Piano Man. That's not it. It's just no. the way you are. It's just the way you are. Yep. It's it- uh, Mopey over the top love song with a I think a sax solo, <laughs> like yep. all the things. Uh, unremarkable, but lovely. Yep. And lyrically, it contains, you know, breakfast cereal style cliches. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. That are very much something he's perfectly happy to use to convey his point. <laughs> yep. Um, and yep. That's, that's fine. And that's fine because I'm not entirely sure they were cliches then, but I think they might have been. And, you know, I think I mentioned this. Don't go changing has become the go to that's a smarmy guy impression. Yeah. You know, yeah. don't go changing. And then you know that that's. Yeah. We, I think, feel like people wrote that in each other's yearbooks. Yeah. <laughs> and to the point now that if you make that joke now, people are like, why is this dumb hack making that joke that it's so within, right. you know. The joke version of it is so old at yeah. this point. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. There's, there's my friend talked about this with the Baja men. He said, so when the Baja men first came out, and they and they were, if you don't remember the Baja men, they're the ones who uh, wanted to know who, who it was who let the dogs out. They didn't know and they wanted to know. Yeah. Um, when the Baja men came out, came out, people were like, ah, the Baja men are ridiculous in stand up. And he goes, because he was describing the arc of a of a jokes in stand up. It was pretty good because he goes, because the Baja men, you're like, you make fun of the Baja men and everybody's like, yeah, you're right, the Baja men, they were kind of ridiculous. And then you're like, hey, the Baja men, and they're like, why is the city making jokes about the Baja men? We all made jokes about the Baja men. And now if you bring up the Baja men, people are like, ah, oh, that was funny, funny, how retro, bringing up the Baja men. <laughs> right. And that's, that's that thing, and that's, you know, any number of dumb things that go through the cycle of that's popular, that's not popular, that's old. I forgot about that. Hey, remember that? And then yeah, and, and then, then it when, just becomes part of the English language. Yeah, exactly. And then and you're like, where does that come from anyway? What's that from? Yeah, 
it's like when you talk to young kids now uh and you say like hey uh hang up the phone or like where does that why do you say hang up the phone what does that mean oh yeah like, oh my god i'm going to die soon is what it means <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, like the, it's just the origin is lost uh, and it's like 15, 20 years ago I and mean, it's gone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's been a very long time since I held a phone like that, a corded phone. When was the last time you used one? I know. I have one in my office and every time it rings, it's like, uh, it's like a home invasion. <laughs> like a, an alarm is going off in my <laughs> office. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somebody wants something and I have no choice. I'm here. I'm, it's, <laughs> it really is like, Jesus Christ, how fucking dare you email me like a person? <laughs> Just going to yeah. pick up the phone and start talking to somebody? Text me on the landline. Yeah, I don't know. I, I do. Sometimes I like seeing a phone out, out like a pay phone. Out in the wild? Yeah. Uh, like thrift shops? Yeah. And I... <laughs> And I want to make a call. Well, I'll see a payphone. Sometimes I think oh, I should make a call. I don't, but it seems like it'd no, be fun. And then I'm like, oh, I uh... bet there's all kinds of sickness on this phone. I'm not going to do that. So, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they uh, there are a lot of booths here, and there's no phones in them anymore. So people just stand inside them when they're raining. Uh, it's very funny. Or they stand inside them with their, their phones, which is very that's yeah, uh, that's a little weird. A weird time sandwich. My wife one time because the phone booth itself represented a person who had passed away because they used to hang out in that area. Hmm. She said, You go tear out that phone. And I was like, Man, no one's gonna care because it's pay phone and it was already. I was like, okay, so somewhere she's got part of the pay phone. <laughs> As like a souvenir. Yeah, a memorial oh. to this person. Because this person would call her on that phone and then they'd get together because that was near where he lived. Gotcha. And uh, and no one used that anymore anyway, except for possibly drug deals. Yeah, I mean, when you see someone on a pay phone, that's your first thought is like, oh, someone wants drugs or somebody is having a medical emergency nearby. Yeah. There's no other reason. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, unless there's a new breed of hipster that like, you know, the kind that like vinyl and then for some reason like videotapes and they're like, oh, I don't like cell phones. The sound on a payphone is so much better. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Okay. Uh, the very first lyric is already uh, pretty, pretty targeted, great, and a bummer. Okay. Uh, Can I stop? you right before that and talk about the title yes um i like the title because it is uh not doesn't come up in the song for one thing oh yeah it's more like this is where i wrote this or this is where i had this revelation um, but the title is sort of written in that style remember when uh your parents had like photo albums and they would uh get pictures back from the photo mat and they'd glue them to the page and then they'd write underneath it with like a silver marker, like Munich 1968 um, or summer comma Highland Falls. Oh. It always just made me, gave me like that warm feeling of like opening an old shitty photo album and those like faded out Polaroids of like probably him sitting on the hood of a VW bug. Yeah. Um, with summer highland falls written underneath it so i think it's nice that he was like this song if you listen to the lyrics isn't anywhere or anytime so let me glue it to the page for you and just say like this is where this happened i don't know highland falls i think it's supposed it's a town upstate right upstate new york so i've been to you know 35 little towns like that they're all pretty similar yeah it's all just people from Manhattan <laughs> going up there to like get away from it all yeah. and then complain that they can't order food at 11 p.m. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, it's very evocative for me because I'm like, I know uh, I've been to like Highland Falls, not the literal one, but versions of it. But the idea. And you do get like this. Wow. You do sit outside and you're like, huh, 
it is either sadness or euphoria most of the time. <laughs> or just start thinking about how you feel a lot. And then like, you're like, okay, Sunday, let's get back to the fucking city so I can stop thinking about myself. Wow. Oh man, that's a real nice. That's a great observation. <laughs> wow. I just, yeah, I always liked it. And then I liked it before I moved here. And now that I've done that a few times, I'm like, oh, I think I get it. I get what he's doing. That's tremendous because I hadn't really, I mean, obviously I know that the words Summer Highland Falls aren't in the song, but I hadn't thought about that because that's all obviously a good thing. And, and boy, that would ruin the song if at the end, <laughs> Summer Highland Falls. <laughs> Yeah, I'll bet it was in there at some point, and a producer probably talked him out of it. He's like, "Don't, don't you? You actually have a good song here. Let's not. Yeah. Don't let's, force it. If you fix this, you can sing this song for the next sixty years, <laughs> and every concert. It'll never get requested, but you can play the hell out of it. Yeah, and it is, and it is damn pretty. But let's uh, so let's start and. There aren't a hell of a lot of lyrics, but they're great lyrics. Um, they, yes. say that, they say that these are not the best of times, but they're the only times I've ever known. I like that a lot. I uh, like that now the knowledge that this isn't the greatest time, like now is a good example. <laughs> right. You could not like now, and a lot of people don't, you know, we're going in the middle of a pandemic. Um, a lot of us have lost people. Even if you haven't lost people, you've lost yeah, your ability yeah. to do things. And even if you haven't lost your job, you're probably isolated in your job. Even you've gone through some isolation and, you know, and even if you're like not isolated, you wish you were, because there's a pandemic. If you have the other kind of job. And yet these are the times, this is the times as they are. Right. It's like these, yeah, they, people are telling me these times aren't great, but it doesn't matter to me because I don't know any other times. Yeah. So I'm just here. And I believe there is a time for meditation in cathedrals of our own. Lovely, lovely. You, you, find, you find the joy where you find it. He's not... I'm, I think objectively, he's not talking about a literal church. He's just talking about right. where you are and where you you're finding your start little... Start from where you are. Yeah. That's all you can do. It's like, look, I, you, uh, yeah, I mean, you don't have to find a special place. <laughs> like, it doesn't have to be a place designed for meditation. Like, you just have to figure out. Yeah. You work with what you got. And I almost feel like some, even the meditation itself isn't absolutely prayer. It, 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 you know, it might be a moment's respite in sex. It might be you're on the beach. It might be any number of things, but it isn't, right. it isn't just spiritual. Driving living. Up state. Yeah. Just driving up state. Yeah. So I like that. It's already right away, just very melancholy. And, um, and I feel like it's very practical. It's a practical view of just the way it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, going upstate for the weekend and uh, just thinking about shit. Yeah. And, uh, Love it. And you, you next. <laughs> <laughs> now I have seen that sad surrender in my lover's eyes and I can only stand apart and sympathize. That's weird. Yeah. Um, it, uh, he does I think you mentioned that he has said that this song is about manic depressives yeah. <laughs> and being in a manic depressive state now I don't know if he means that clinically or colloquially um, almost surely colloquially yeah but yeah. yeah but it does seem like he has bummed out his girlfriend <laughs> yeah. but he can't help his behavior yeah according to these lyrics now, I have I've seen that sad surrender in my lover's eyes. Like I'm I'm observing that she is unhappy with something about me. Yeah. Um, but I can only stand apart and sympathize. Uh, which might be the, you know, that might be why she's so bummed out, because <laughs> you're standing apart and sympathizing. And he is, 
helping or changing. Yeah, and he is also sad too. I can, I yeah. can sympathize. He gets it. Um, you know, I almost there's a part of me that also wants to take the lyric talking about a lover almost literally because the thing that it evokes in my mind are those moments when you and a lovely lady made love because that was what you both wanted at that time. And then it was fine. But then there was just a little bit of sadness afterwards because, because there's a lot of things you'll do in life that don't actually solve any problems and that you wish they would. You wish that right. sharing something like that with somebody would just make it all better. You know, walking in the park, you're in the trees and you lay out in the grass and it's beautiful. And you're like, man, I'm still sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's a lot of what life is like. There's a lot of like being this, like this song is a, a lot of uh, the experience of being alone in a crowd. This is being at a, yeah being at a party with people that you're like i like these people this should be fun right this should be working i uh there's a phenomena in pictures that i'm in that has amused me over the years and it even is in pictures that i'm in with my family um but you remember the dumb group i was in fancy ketchup you remember sure that? very great if you look at almost any photo of us that was taken um that wasn't staged. That was just a picture of us in a group setting. You'll almost, if you didn't know us, you would always conclude that me in the picture is a guy who happened to also be there. <laughs> There's really, it's something separating you. Yeah. I have a picture of my family, and it is my brother, who I <laughs> love dearly, my two sisters, and they're all looking at the camera like this, going, and I am going, <laughs> and I've said to my sister, I'm like, what, does anybody know what I'm looking at? Because I see it, what am I upset about? And I've had, I've got pictures with my mom where you, if you didn't know, you'd go, so why'd you take that picture with that lady? <laughs> right, you two don't seem to know each other. Yeah. I, you know, I have a, I love so many people and I have, but I have an isolation. So the song uh, spoke to me. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I think, yeah, I think everybody can sort of has experienced it. Some people live in it more than others. <laughs> um, and us, us people in comedy sort of know it pretty well. Yeah. Like we are, you know, pushed out to the outer ring to be observers for whatever reason. Indeed. Um, and yeah, we, I mean, we do literally stand apart and sympathize. But it is like, you know, I talk about it all the time when we are talking about comedy. I'm like, this is why like athletes and popular kids aren't funny. It's like, they can't make observations. They are the thing that is being observed. <laughs> yeah. We're all looking at them. They don't have any observations. They have actions and behaviors, <laughs> but they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. I can say to you or, you know, another like chess club fucking nerd, <laughs> but like, did you notice that the jock always does that? And he would go, ah, oh, yeah, you didn't make a good point. <laughs> uh, if I say to the jock, you know, you always do this. He will kill me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... I mean, it's, yeah, it's that thing that makes you a good artist or a good comedian, but a sad person. Yeah. And I think he's just sort of like maybe exploring that a little bit. Mm -hmm. it's, this is a little bit about, here's why I play the piano and make up my songs. It's because I'm like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second half of that, I think you have another part of that yeah. verse. I can only stand apart and sympathize for we are always what our situations hand us. It's either sadness or euphoria. I don't, I can't agree with that. That sounds like clinical <laughs> manic depression. Um, I mean, euphoria is literally listed as a symptom of mania. Yeah. Um, 
So I maybe, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if he was ever diagnosed with that or self-diagnosed. I mean, a lot of, a lot of these dramatic artsy people like to self-diagnose and tell yeah. people they're, oh, I'm OCD. Oh, I have ADD. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you just have some qualities that you don't care for. Yeah, I do. I do a similar thing, but I just claim to have rickets. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, your femurs are not straight. <laughs> not the straightest you know what i feel is, that... Uh, boner pills <laughs> um for that again by the way <laughs> um well, this is objectively not true what he's saying part of what i think is being said in this that i think might be true or at least or at least it's a bummer expression is um i, I sort of hear like a lot, your happiness and your sorrow is some is quite a lot of times not a product of your free will because yeah. you're being handed and i do believe that happens a lot in just sure. unfortunately is the truth is that sometimes your your happiness and sadness is very dependent upon a set of circumstances that are wildly out of your control right and what and while it would be nice to be just the the zen monk who just understands to be content with <laughs> the way that life is. Right. But it, it, most of us just aren't that. Yeah. Sometimes just a bad thing happens to you out of nowhere. Yeah. Not because you didn't work out enough or whatever. <laughs> or you don't read the Bible. Yeah. You just say, yeah, a car hit my dog. Like, oh, well, there's not much you could have done about that in advance. You got handed a situation. Having a great uh, day, gas leak. Yeah. <laughs> Loudon Wainwright, who I also like very much, has, uh, I don't remember which song, but it has a line that's uh, similar and beautifully simple, which is, uh, anything can happen when there's nothing you can do. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're all up against. Yeah. Like we can row our little boats, but ultimately, <laughs> shit can just happen to you. Yep. Um, so that's fair enough, but it's either sadness or euphoria. I think there's plenty of, uh, I mean, he has a song called Shades of Grey, right. <laughs> many albums later, but I guess he figured it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that could very, and that could have been the way it felt like at the time. Like I'm either, then I could be, and I, there are times, certainly I think I felt this way, and I'm sure you have too. You're like, I'm either ecstatic or I'm pissed. In my 20s for sure i was either oh. kind of mad or having the best time in the in the world right or both within an hour yeah <laughs> and I, so many times <laughs> I, I, I recall you having those yep and I, I can remember so many times too when i because because i just like to make jokes i just do i just like to say stuff based on what you've said or what's going on and so throughout my life, there have been times when this would be sadness and euphoria for me. I'll say a thing, everybody <laughs>, laughs, right? Right. And then the other one is I'll say a thing and someone is mad. And I'm like, I was just trying to, I wasn't, I wasn't going for mad. <laughs> and now uh -huh. I got to apologize for a thing. And I'm pretty sure I was just joking, but okay. Right. I thought it was going to be a whole different reaction. Yeah. But now like. Rindy's yelling at me. <laughs> uh, I remember. Yeah. That's funny you mentioned Rindy. I love Rindy. I remember. I remember one time making a comment, and you know she found me funny. Sure. I, at one point, I made some comment, and it's all divorced of context because it was decades ago. But I just remember her going, "Oh, go fuck yourself." I was like, oh. <laughs> "Wow." Huh. It's a clean miss on your part. And it's it's so <laughs> funny when you're in that situation with friends and like <laughs> talked about being on a riverboat and losing the money right away. Remember that? <laughs> right. It's similar when you're like at a dinner and and like the appetizers haven't come and somebody's like, oh, fuck yourself. And you're like, ah, oh, there's a whole dinner ahead of me. Oh, yeah, I'm trapped. <laughs> I want to eat my sandwich, but... Yeah, and this was in the days before you could just look at your phone for the rest of the night. Yeah, you had to look at the person. 
when we were young, you had to look at the person for the rest <laughs> of the night and they would be mad the whole night. Uh, how often, by the way, have you been at dinner with, with someone you're particularly close with and you've known for a long time and you both at some point, one of you says, so let's just tonight not look at our phones. Oh, uh-huh. And then a little while later you realize, oh, that didn't take. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it never is going to take is the point I'm at now. When somebody says, let's not look at our phones. I'm like, oh, you mean until you go pee? Yeah. And then I will look at my phone and then I'll still be looking at it when you sit down again and you'll know it's over. Yeah. The little soap bubble that we made has popped and now we can look at our phone. <laughs> And you, I mean, you didn't have to pee. You just wanted to get away from me, probably so you could look at your phone. Yeah. No, you took your phone to the, to the can. So you, <laughs> you're tweeting something yeah. dumb or whatever. Yeah. But I saw your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> when I checked my phone. <laughs> when I checked my phone. So we're both busted. <laughs> All right. You want to start this next? It's only yeah. like three little verses. Yeah. They're, they're fat with sadness though. It's great. So are arguing will compromise and realize that nothing's ever changed uh for all our mutual experience yeah. our separate conclusions uh -huh. are the same pointlessness sometimes of having this is a breakup i think oh yeah yeah it could be a breakup yeah. it could be probably be better if it was a breakup or it could be just a ongoing semi-sludgy toxic relationship that isn't sure. the worst relationship, but it would almost be better if it was the worst. So you'd get out. It, it's a, uh, right. It's just, you know, trudging through sand to try to maintain this relationship. And right. And it doesn't, I don't think it even has to be like a sexual relationship. It can be friends yeah. or even family relationship where I'm like, you just, yeah, we talked about it already. That didn't help because yeah. I we reached different conclusions and you're wrong. Yep. And, and now I feel shitty and we're here together in Highland Falls. <laughs> yeah. And you can't order anything after 7 p.m. There's one restaurant. <laughs> and it's either <laughs> shitty or the most expensive restaurant. And you didn't want to spend $300 tonight. Yeah, I went upstate to get away from Manhattan pricing. One time and, uh, I was I'm eating weird sushi in the mountains. Yeah, one time I was uh, in Colorado with my wife and there was one restaurant we could go to and it was Chinese food and I don't remember what little city we were in. But, you know, bad Chinese food can sometimes be the worst thing in the world. And it's hard to describe how bad a restaurant can be, but I think I can describe this restaurant perfectly. Mm. One of the menu items at the Chinese restaurant, cheeseburger. Oh, huh. <laughs> Anything Chinese about it? Oh uh, yeah. Everything. Um, yes, but so there's an old, an old joke I used to make sometimes and never really got a big laugh, but I would say that one of the most racist things I've ever heard directed at Italians is calling Chef Boyardee Italian food, you know, the canned food. Right. And I felt that way about this restaurant. I thought, do you, do you hate the Chinese? Because you are not doing anybody any favors here. <laughs> and of course, it's all it's all Caucasians making your Chinese food. And I don't care what food it is. If it's Greek food, I want to see a Greek. If it's Fair Mexican enough. food, I'd like to see a Mexican guy or lady cooking my food. And if it's- I want some culinary DNA. Go to Japanese food and it's in the sushi and the, I don't want to see anybody who looks like me fucking up my sushi. <laughs> no, no. Where would you be cooking? Yeah, <laughs> and that was, and that was this Chinese restaurant. And that's, man, there's a Summer Highland Falls experience. It was this one stupid restaurant. I was there with family and, but we were, we were there because things were bad. We were there to help out. Some bad uh, stuff had happened. So it wasn't like I was on vacation really. Right, right. We were like making sure, like seriously, part of our trip was making sure somebody could get their oxygen machine. Yeah. Woo. 
there's a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the worst when it's like, it's all the shitty parts of going on vacation, but none of the good part. Yeah. They're like, oh, I have to still have to pack and call people and get a cat sitter and yeah. all that stuff. And then you get there and like, here's more bad stuff. <laughs> but pretty soon you'll go home to your shitty life. <laughs> oh, it is terrible. When you get back, you won't be rested, but you immediately have to go to work because you've not been at work. And you burn some vacation days. So you'll be working for a while. <laughs> yeah. That cool. was this injury, by the way. My injury and then my sickness is like, I just watched all my vacation time evaporate. Oh. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I hope you had a good vacation. <laughs> <laughs> there were good days. There really were. Because just being at home, I enjoy anyway. Sure. The, you know, the pandemic is good in the sense that <laughs> no one's asking me to come visit at home. That's nice. And yep. That, I I don't know how I became that relative, but you remember when you were a kid, there'd be a relative you rarely saw. Yeah. Go up every now and then and you liked them perfectly fine. And and sometimes they were even one of your favorites because they were like an uncle or aunt who didn't force you to hug them. Right. Cool stories. And you're like, well, my parents don't do any stuff. You do stuff? That's great. Yeah. I remember I visited one of my nieces. Yeah. I remember that guy. I remember I visited one of my nieces and my sister. I love my sister very much. She's very sweet. She's like, give your uncle a hug. And she was a little nervous. And I was like, why would you have to hug me? I said. And she laughed. And I go, you don't know me. Let's, how are you doing? Tell me, why, tell me about this <laughs> art project. And uh, by the end of the week, we were great. We had gotten along great. And I don't think we ever hugged <laughs> because why do you force kids to hug people? Yeah. Yeah. You're just indoctrinating them. Yeah. And in then, weird way. you know, I love hugs. I'm all about them, but, but that's a thing you should want, not a thing you're made to do. Yeah. It shouldn't be an errand. Yeah. <laughs> and then you start to have fucked up intimacy issues. Yep. And I think I smell fine, but any old person I ever met smelled funny to me. Oh, yeah. And I guarantee that little kid would go, Uncle Jim smells funny. Uncle Jim smells like comic books and whatever else I smell. <laughs> yeah, you can't help it. It's uh, nature. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably just like some weird pheromone we start giving off when we turn 50. Yeah. So let's live. Hey, one. should I get back on these lyrics? Yeah, bust. <laughs> Bust. You want some bars? <laughs> uh, now, this is my, I really enjoy this part. Um, now we are forced to recognize our inhumanity. A reason coexists, our reason coexists with our insanity. What? Yeah. Now we, I have to read it again. Now we are forced to recognize our inhumanity. Our reason coexists with our insanity. It's beautifully written and sung, and it's yeah. good syllables. I have a little trouble breaking down what he's talking about. Um, so I, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I think as this breakup is happening, yeah. they're being forced to recognize their bad behavior. Yeah, and that it's fundamental. I yeah. Think it's not just that there's bad behavior. I think it goes even deeper because now we're talking about a fundamental problem with people, a built-in cruelty, a built-in yeah. sometimes, you know, that we can sometimes, we sometimes bridge the gap. We sometimes are our better selves, but obviously not today. <laughs> no. And it, yeah, and it does, I mean, the second line is the problem is that we, our reason coexists with our insanity. We are all reasonable and we're all crazy. Yeah. And it's so hard to maintain any kind of relationship when, to, when everybody has both of those things all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody, you know, since, certainly since this pandemic has started, I think everyone is dealing with their own reason and insanity. Yeah. Um, you just, I mean, we're all being forced to sit and spend a lot of time introspecting yeah, and being like, oh, I'm fucked up. 
I have, you know, usually I'm busy and talking to people and I don't realize yeah. how many insane thoughts I have, how many weird behaviors are growing. Yeah. Um, but I am a reasonable enough person to know that I'm insane. Yeah. And we're, we're all kind of like cycling through that every day. Oh yeah, for um, sure. I feel it. I mean, I feel like I get up and I make my coffee and I'm like, all right, we're going to have a day. I've got some things I got to do. And then in the middle of the afternoon, you're just like, oh, I could kill that cat. And nobody would know. <laughs> I could just step on her. And I wouldn't have to change the litter box. I'm gonna <laughs> die anyway. And then you're like, what am I doing? Wait, what? <laughs> and it's just like weird things like that, that normally you'd be in a meeting. You wouldn't have time to have that <laughs> internal weirdness. Yeah. You know, um, I, we are, a lot of our energy goes outward because yeah. we live in a society <laughs> or a family. Um, and I think when you're alone, you're like, oh, I, there are some, I'm going to look at some dark truths no matter what, no matter how long I leave the TV on. Yeah. You're ultimately by yourself. Um, you know, I think that's why, like, uh, in general, in life, you are not alone much and when you are you fall asleep <laughs> because your body is defending you from the two sides of your brain yeah your brain needs yeah your brain and just your personhood needs needs that outside in yeah just so that you're not yeah for sure when i was stuck at home with my injury because i couldn't go out I found I started to have sleep problems mm -hmm. part more more than I ever do now, but because I've always kind of had a little trouble falling asleep sometimes, but now I would just be in the middle of the night and there would just be these thoughts and I'd want to talk to somebody or wake somebody up. And I'm like, well, I can't do that. So I'm just going to have to deal with this. <laughs> right. I told you one of the days I was just laying in bed and I was, and I thought, Oh, what if I'm in a coma? yeah well how do i check yeah how would i, I can't know? check because maybe that's that's what a coma is yeah <laughs> maybe you can't convince somebody that they're in a coma and then i and then if i was in a coma and then that makes me mad if i was in a coma and i'm like this is the world i created what the, come on <laughs> right what stuff what's wrong with you that you created this i remember one time i had you know you'll have sex dreams one time sometimes yeah. Yep. I had a dream once. I was young at the time, I get, but not that young. I was in my 20s. I had a dream once that I was looking at pictures of naked women in the dream. Uh huh. Picture. I can do that. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing worse than a utilitarian dream. <laughs> we both worked in restaurants where we had to do a lot of side work. Like you have to fold up a bunch of napkins with forks and knives and you have to like make 200 of those before you can leave. And then yep. you go home and fall asleep and then you're making more of them in your dreams. <laughs> Wake up, God damn it. I didn't even get minimum wage for that dream. And now I have to go back and do it. Yeah. The worst. That stuff, yeah. Oh, I've had so many sex dreams that get ruined by like i'll do something weird in the dream and the woman will go that's weird what are you doing gross or something like that <laughs> it'll just be an awkward getting dressed and yelling at each other dream instead it's like i don't i can do this without the dream i can ruin sex <laughs> <laughs> or i can succeed <laughs> It's like every time it has gone wrong in my dreams. Oh, like, I'll, we'll be like getting ready to rock and there's like somebody pounding on the door. <laughs> like, what is happening? It never has worked out. Oh, that's, oh, that's great. Cause you realize uh, then that that's not even a sex dream. That's a stress dream. A stress dream. That tricked you into thinking you were having a yeah. sex dream. It was a, a stress in sex's clothing. Yeah. Or, some version of that. You got tricked by your subconscious. I thought I was going to have a great sex dream. But here, here's the good news from the next lyric. But we choose 
between reality and madness. Ah, this is new. We haven't been able to choose anything so far in the lyrics. Yeah, that's true. The first verse ended with, we are always what our situations hand us. This verse, but we choose between reality and madness. Uh, so I guess those don't cancel each other out necessarily. No. I mean, we are always at least dealing with what our situations hand us, but we can choose to go crazy. Yeah. Or we can choose to live in reality. And that's, can a, deal with it. that's a solid expression of a very old debate about whether or not you have free will. And right. one of the conclusions is, and I'm, I'll butcher it, but one of the <laughs> conclusions is that you don't, we'll just say it this way. You don't really have free will, but it's better if you acted like you did. Yes. And that's, that's kind of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, now I'm trying to think if, I'm, if I have free will or not. I think so. Yeah. I just don't think it does you any good because you only, you have limited will. Yeah. If I had free will, then I would never die and I'd be nine feet tall, but yeah. I can't do those things. But I can, you know, I can go see a play yeah. if I want while I'm busy dying. But then old Sam Harris, you know, Sam Harris, not the singer, but the neuroscientist. Sure, sure. Would say that in one of his books, uh, this would be one of his smart things, not one of his uh, Islamic racist things. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> In one of his things about talking about the brain, he's like, but you could even argue that you going to the play is not even free will because of the way the way that your neurons fire and the way that the decisions happen, there is a sense in which the neuron that will make you do that you do a thing with fires before you know it. Right. So there is that whole thing. But at the end of it, of course, the ultimate conclusion is if you think you have free will, that's just about good enough because- right. If I can't tell the difference, then it, uh, then there isn't a difference. Yeah. If Mario in Mario world thinks he has free will, he does. He, he just was gonna go fight Bowser. If, it's, if he has the idea that he's got free will, he got it. Yeah. And we all know he don't. Right. We all know also that he is a not that great of a plumber. It's just not. <laughs> no, no, never repairing any of them. I mean, the pipes in that world are fucked up. Yeah, I don't never. know. What, there's too many pipes that go up, which is contrary to how plumbing is supposed to work anyway. Right. I mean, the the Romans oh. figured this out already. And now you got pipes that go up. You're like, you're, you're for sure going to have a bunch of backed up crap. Yes. So. Although, who's crapping? Nope, there's nobody there but turtles. Turtles and mushrooms, you're right. That's tr that's fair. But Bowser, there's at least him, and he's a big guy. True, fair enough. So if you're even just having to deal with him, that is not a fun kingdom to be in. You're right. Yeah. And he, clearly, he's not happy with your work. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> and then we get into, and again, this is amazing. Now, just thinking about this, there's five pieces to this song yeah i don't think anything absolutely repeats except for a phrase there's a phrase it's either sadness or euphoria repeats but there's not but that's not even a repeat in my opinion it's a theme right and i it is it's a very economical song lyrically yes how thoughtlessly we dissipate our energies Perhaps we don't fulfill each other's fantasies. Oh, mm. how, thought, how thoughtlessly we dissipate our energies. Perhaps we don't fulfill each other's fantasies. I'm pretty sure this is about sex, right? Sex, uh, love, relationship. Yeah, this is not what either one of us was fantasizing about. And yeah. we're burning a lot of energy trying to make it work. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it could be just the energy you expand arguing a dumb point over and over again and, and not, or even not a dumb point, but just something you can't reach a consensus with. Right. And just like, this is beside the point and you can't bring yourself to admit that it's beside the point. Yeah. No, this is the point. It's like, 
Yeah, it, it is. You are burning oil. Yeah. Or nothing. And the problem is, like, you just don't fulfill each other's fantasies. Like, look, this, the argument we're having is not the problem. Yeah. It's like a, a little symptom, and we're treating it as the whole problem because we're not a match, whatever that means. Yep. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Well, I don't like it, but I dislike <laughs> it right away. Like, it's a bummer. And as we I do said, like uh, the heightened language of this whole song. Yeah. Uh, including words like dissipate and cathedral and sympathize and coexist. I'm like, he's, he's a, it's good uh, vocabulary for him. Yeah. Even euphoria is a big old word. And well, and a very great thing is that he sings it like a guy from Long Island. <laughs> euphoria. <laughs> Either sadness or euphoria. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be cool if I was confused and I was like, is Yafaria another boxer? <laughs> Again, you have to have a listen to another episode. So if you go back. <laughs> um, and as we stand upon the ledges of our lives, oof. Great. Standing on the ledge. Yeah. With our respective similarities. Respective is a word in a song. That's funny because it's because it, it's not like a, a word that just rolls off the tongue, but it works really well in the way he's... By the way, he sings the song great, doesn't he? He sings the song great. It's it's kind of high. I yeah. guess he was younger and could get those notes. Yeah. Um, but it is, yeah, it's another... It The whole thing is heightened language. It's almost like he broke up with a professor or a psychologist or something and picked up all these words along the way yeah like he if you see him in a bar and buy him a drink he's not going to use any of these words when he's talking to you yeah um by the way for anybody uh watching first thank you also but look at the cover to turnstiles um because i have it up here now as i'm looking at the lyrics and it's a really great cover um it's for some reason he's wearing a business tie <laughs> and oh, yeah. there's a dude in the background who's real mad that he has to go to he just looks he looks like fake sad and then there's a uh like black guy next to him who's like looks like shaft and then there's <laughs> marilyn monroe for some reason oh and there's a grandmother and her daughter and her daughter is not happy that she's gonna have to go to a prep school and then there's a guy on the right who I think sells cocaine. <laughs> and there's a lady in the background who just almost doesn't seem to fit. I guess she's me. So like, hey, she shouldn't have been in this picture. <laughs> but she's wearing headphones. Oh. Uh, it, it's a great album cover. And also, it's you you would not miss that this was the 70s. Those are some giant ass headphones. Yeah. But uh it's a pretty well thought out cover, actually. And Billy, Billy's just looking at us. And it's almost, a, and he kind of has a look in his eyes like, look at these idiots. Like, That's what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I, do go look at it. It's pretty funny looking. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. I've always liked it. It's, uh, and it's uh, a, a tribute to the New York City subway system for sure. Yep. I think, I feel like I remember that he moved to LA to make this album after making other ones in New York. I'm not sure if that's true. Mm, okay. But I feel like it was like, oh, this I'm, cha I'm changing my whole life up. I'm going through a turnstile into a new life. I think that was sort of the idea. Okay, yeah. Uh, and it is, I think he's surrounded by people who are, you know, going through transitions in their lives and they're all very different from each other. And yeah, I think that's, he's going for a vibe. I get that. And the other thing I just noticed about the picture, if you take a look at the cover, is he's wearing a tie, but it's clearly the end of the day getting off the subway because the tie is loosened up. It's like, ah, oh, come on, we're almost done with this nonsense. <laughs> so that even goes more towards your what you're saying, which is that he's, you know, going through a turnstile onto something else. He's not bound up to what he had to do before. Right. Um, I'm leaving New York behind. 
And this is what New York looks like. <laughs> it's a guy who kind of looks like Donald Trump dancing with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> and a guy with a bunch of books. Yeah, he's, he's not happy. This is a, yeah, this is a weird photo shoot. Yeah. Um, the lettering also, I think, is supposed to look like New York City subway lettering. Yeah. At least of the time. It's pretty great. And uh, so we end it with, and as we stand upon the ledges of our lives, great, with our respective similarities. And that's great. As we're breaking up, the things we have in common aren't good either. No, they, they have us on the ledge. Yeah. And uh, that's definitely a thing we've all done where we're like, not only is it the differences that are causing us trouble, but we get into fights because the similarities are problematic. Yes. Everybody hates a mirror. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, in my family, my mother and my sister fight constantly. And it's because they're very, very much alike. And I think they see a behavior and they're like, oh, I hate that fucking behavior in myself. So I will yell at it in a different person so I don't have to feel bad. <laughs> um, I, yeah, we do that all the time. I do not want someone like me around. Yeah. No, when I, I was a kid, I had a, I had a cousin who had this dumb Mark Hamill haircut. Not even joking. Had a dumb Mark Hamill haircut. <laughs> Dumb sandy blonde hair, talked too <laughs> much, made jokes all the time that I did not think were funny. Now I'm pretty sure the problem was also some of those weren't funny, but he was too much like me. And what would happen was at the beginning of the vacation when we were with the relatives, at the beginning of the vacation, we were thick as thieves because we'd have fun together because we were similar. Yeah, age. But within about three days, I'm like, yeah, I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm close to beating the crap out of you. <laughs> yep, I know it well. <laughs> I don't need another fucking sarcastic dude <laughs> who doesn't like anything. I'm like, I can do that. Yeah. I need to be with uh, joyful people who don't imagine themselves having cancer constantly. <laughs> They're more fun. And they like me because it's funny to them that somebody could be like me. Yeah. I'm like, great. If it works for you, great. It's killing me, but if great. <laughs> hang out. <laughs> hey, when you have those cancer thoughts, because yeah. I, I get those, what's your version? I'll tell you mine, then you tell me yours. My version is when I imagine having it is I imagine how I'll tell people or what I do, because I've always wanted to be the guy, I was like, boy, if I had cancer, I would not be that guy who was like positive, because that guy's <laughs> annoying to me sometimes. Uh-huh. You know, and no, again, you cope with how you cope, but there years ago, there was this little kid, Manny Stefanovich, who wrote poems and stuff, and everybody was like, he's so optimistic, and I'm like, I just wish one time he would just have written a poem about how this was a raw deal. Yeah. So that's all kind of, and then I'm like, and who would I tell off? <laughs> right. What can I get away with in the interim? <laughs> so what's uh, your version when you have those? Or is it just the scared that you might? Um, it's certainly the scared that I might. And then I get into very trying to very vividly picture what it's like to stop existing. Oh. And then I go into that hole. I'm like, well, what's it like to not exist? Well, it obviously it's not like anything. You, there's no you to experience anything. Yeah. And then I can spiral down that. I'm like, that's fucking insane. And then the only way out of that is like, oh, I also didn't exist for all of human history <laughs> until 54 years ago. Yeah. And that was fine. I don't have any bad memories from that period. Yeah. I was like, oh, I want to exist, but I don't. You know, <laughs> I, I get into that. And also, yeah, what would I do with the interregnum? Like, all right, you have six months. I'm like, oh, fuck. I've already wasted so much time. Now I have a deadline 
and probably lots of treatments to deal with while I'm also doing yeah. what? Set up a scholarship? I don't fucking know. Hand out money to people. I think just fuck shit up. <laughs> throw, rent, throw as many wrenches as I can into various systems. A lot of streaking. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. I, yeah. 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 Probably, High on my list. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Probably full time. Yeah. I would just live nude. Yeah, you're, gonna, <laughs> you're gonna see my dong for sure. Uh, there's a real phenomenon that happens with people diagnosed with cancer that's fascinating. That people obviously are bummed and it sucks and you cope with it. And then of course there are those cases where it was a misdiagnosis. Yes, I know what you're talking about. And there's this funny phenomena where the person will have been dealing with coming to terms with the fact that their life is finite and putting their, their effects in order. And right. then they find out they're not dying and they experience sometimes uh, sadness and anger yeah. at the fact that they didn't have cancer. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's peculiar. They usually come around and realize, oh, wait, wait, oh, wait a minute. But they go through this experience of i made peace with this. And I bet it's a lot of, I'm trying to figure out why that is, but I bet there was like a lot of like, you felt sad and then you were like, yeah, but I'm not going to have to get a haircut again. And I'm not going to have to do this. Right. Other you let go. Yeah. You let go of a lot of things and then they're all back. All your errands come back. <laughs> yeah. And you, you realize like, oh, well, I'm, now I'm going to have to do this all over again someday. Yeah. Unless like a safe falls on my head. Yeah, because you, you made, you were like, I'm not going to have to work anymore. That's nice. You did a lot of emotional labor to get to some sane place. And then yeah. somebody was like, mm, you did that for nothing. That is an, it's an interesting phenomenon. And then I'm like. I'm uh, my favorite thing about that phenomenon uh, there's an episode of House that uh, wherein a cancer patient is told, oh, it was a misdiagnosis, you're fine. And he is furious and is screaming at Dr. Wilson, who is supposed to be the best oncologist in <laughs> New Jersey. Uh, he runs the whole department at this teaching hospital, but he is taken aback. He can't believe it. Why is this guy mad? <laughs> And I just watching it, I was like, you, I know about this phenomenon. Yeah. You're an oncologist. You've never seen this before. <laughs> yeah. It really made me laugh that some TV writer didn't think of that. Yeah. And it's, it's very funny too, because House in that episode, he's aware that this might happen because he's so brilliant right. that he's aware that a common thing might happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is about writing geniuses into your tv shows is like oh he, he can only be as smart as the smartest writer yeah yeah and, or the best researcher <laughs> <laughs> so everybody else has to be a little bit dumb maybe yeah. yeah the trick they have to pull with house of course is they had to go through medical journals and find things that only happen to like four people right and he knew it <laughs> right yeah. And a lot of them that, that you were like, oh, some somebody else might should have figured that out also. Yeah. There's <laughs> yeah. It's like, hey, did anybody notice this huge bruise on his leg? No. Really? <laughs> isn't somebody bathing this patient twice a day or something? Also, isn't part of the examination looking? No. Yeah, didn't start with looking. Yeah. <sighs> I love that show. I could do a podcast about that show. I would do it with you. That's one of my favorite shows. We run out of songs. There's an episode, my favorite episode, I think it's called Three Stories, where you finally find out how Haas jacked up his leg. That's a yeah. great. great. And what's her name? The She was on Once and Again, who's his true love for a while. I can't remember the actress's name. Oh, yes. Um, it starts with an S. What is her name? Oh no, I should know this. She's a very beautiful actress. Yeah. She was like the hospital's lawyer. Samantha B. 
no, that can't be right. <laughs> yeah, she was great. Um, she was Celia Ward. Celia Ward, yeah, she's tremendous. She's a tremendous actress. So once it again was a really great show, and I enjoyed that show. And I, when it got canceled prematurely, it was comforting to go, oh, but she's on House now. <laughs> Phew. Yeah. Um, a lot of great actors and actresses, and and man, they had a lot of pretty doctors on that show. <laughs> they really did. <laughs> I got to meet uh, Lisa Edelstein, Dr. Oh. Cuddy. She's like the best friend of a friend of mine. Um, and then I met her and it was like, oh no, she's incredibly nice and smart and cool. And I was like, yep. oh man, that's great. <laughs> you, I would have guessed that because her, her fan interactions are you know, they're the idealized fan interactions and she's uh, always comes across as grateful that she's had jobs. Yes. And even though she walked away from that show over money issues, I, at the time I was like, eh, she's got it right. You, sh you guys should pay her if you want her to do this thing. Just pay her the last season. Yeah. And she's smart enough to know that either I go get work now or pay me because when the show's over, I'm going to need work. And, right. and particularly for an actress, if she's like looking at the statistics, she's like, okay, I'm this age. If yep. I got to move on, I probably should move on now while I'm young enough to get this dumb kind of part. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise. So I don't have Hallmark channel. Yeah. Oh man. I bet there are a lot of older actresses who are just so grateful when the Hallmark channel emerged. <laughs> Oh yeah, like oh. I'm ordering seamless. Oh nice, yeah. <laughs> That's all right, isn't it? Yes. Um, so how about I'll tell you what we're gonna do next week, um, and then uh, oh, and then you'll do trivia. Oh yes. So um, my uh, Kyle requested that we do Scandinavian skies. Oh great. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Uh, in the classic genre of uh, we're on tour and we're very tired from yeah. being on tour. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And now trivia. When Billy Joel uh, moved to LA to work on this album, he also played in piano bars under a different name. Oh. What was that name? Um, Joe Billyson. Oh my God, you got it. <laughs> he played under the name Bill Martin. Bill Martin. <laughs> uh, because his middle name is Martin. Oh, okay. Marty. He's Marty from Long Island. Um, I do remember finding out his middle name and uh, immediately going, hey, he's not Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was Italian forever. Because yeah. I thought everybody from New York was Italian. Yeah. I was very young and we were a military family and so we didn't know about Jews. <laughs> uh, there were, there, I, obviously there were Jews in the military, but we didn't meet any yeah. that I recall. My father was not inclined to have Jewish people to the house. Hmm. That's okay. a whole other podcast. <laughs> he was a bad man. Sorry, yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, uh, my, yeah, I don't think my, my father was good with, my father was a dick in different ways. Um, he was good with most people, but he did not like the Japanese very much, but he came by it in a way that was pretty honest, which was in Okinawa, they took his leg. All right. So probably not all of them. Right. But sure transference yeah not <laughs> all of them but for sure all of his leg so it's just yeah i mean a lot of i think a lot of yeah the racism from that generation comes from that, those kinds of places well and i know a lot of jewish folks today who are not who aren't even world war ii generation who don't like the idea of buying german goods sure and the truth is the current germany is one of the most progressive countries oh yeah that, period 
Yeah, you can't drive around with a swastika on your car, but you can here. Yep, and they're not afraid to accept the complicated nature of their own past because they really don't want it to happen again. It's, um, it's yeah, which is also a theme of the song we just looked at. Oh, yeah. I don't know what's behind you. Okay. I, the quote that is familiar to me, it's the second start of the right and then right on till morning. It feels like it's maybe from Peter Pan. It is. It is from Peter Pan. Yeah. Hmm. And can I, I just. Who said it? Uh, Peter. Peter said it. Yeah. So he's given directions. Yeah. He also, he also might have told you um, to think happy thoughts. He'd probably tell you that too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I bet, now this is for real. If I bet you, if somebody told you to think happy thoughts, you'd be pissed off at their suggestion that that was like a that. good thing. Yeah, I wouldn't like that. I'd, I would be, uh, I, would, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're going for. Yeah, well, uh, it's probably, first of all, if these are awful directions, aren't they? They are. If you're, if you were asking- vague. vague directions. Yep. Vague uh, directions, almost useless if you were asking me to help you or give you guidance. <laughs> Why can't I get this? Okay, if I was offering you some dumb guidance, you know, offering you my opinion. Some bad advice. Yep, bad advice. Some bad advice? Uh, bad advice for sure. Oh, what kind God. of advice is it? Huh? What kind of advice is it? It's uh, uh, travel advice. Well, yes. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, space, outer space advice. Well, it is a quote from a specific person. Uh huh. Yeah. Peter. It's, a, it's a quote from Peter Pan. Yep. Don't give me bad advice, Peter Pan. Yeah. Or. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm super stuck. I don't know it. That's I don't funny. know. Well, you probably don't want my Peter Pan advice. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> wait, what is that? Pressure? That's pressure. It's pressure. I oh, brought up pressure. Faith, and your Peter Pan advice. You have no scars, no scars. on oh, your face. <laughs> That's a David Bowie song, right? Yeah, you can. Uh, <laughs> I think we were both doing David Bowie. <laughs> he, he might have been trying to do David Bowie. <laughs> hey, that's a good observation when we get around to pressure. Maybe he was. We should look into that. All your life is Channel 13. That's... Which uh, I moved to New York, and Channel 13 is uh, PBS. Oh, that's the streets. What, well, does, what it does it mean? All right, I, people have had enough of us by now. Hey, I'll tell you what it means. <laughs> I like that part a lot. <laughs> oh, it's great. All right, Scandinavian Skies, episode 15 coming up, babies. Looking forward to it. Requested by our friend Kyle. Kyle, thank you for uh, taking the time. That was actually Kyle, great. you got a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> What's so your event now, Kyle? Drop your Venmo in the comments. <laughs> yeah. I, will, I will send you twenty dollars. Yep. Yep. And I and I will uh, I won't. So you just get twenty dollars. Yeah. Because I'm not just Kyle. Person. Yeah. Not, not the other twelve people <laughs> listening to this. Yeah, I ain't got hundred and twenty bucks. No, are you crazy? I got to pay rent. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, good enough. Yeah. <laughs>